next on Unsolved Mysteries. Two young women involved in the Phoenix, Arizona single scene are murdered. And authorities need your help to find the killer. A young man finds the girl of his dreams. Then the troubles begin. What did Georgia Boyd have to hide? Police search a basement and discover a body that's been there for over a year. Mysterious diaries reveal a strange tale of murder. And this coin scam has built 5,000 people out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Would you fall for it? You might have that one vital clue to help solve one of our cases. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us. just outside of Phoenix in Glendale, Arizona. A fight is about to erupt. Diane Shawcroft, 20, and her best friend, Jennifer Luth, 19, had recently left their homes in Colorado and moved in with Diane's older sister, Christina. Look at this place, it's a mess. When did you become mom? I said no smoking. That was my last cigarette. It's fine, maybe I'll just go then. They said they were going to walk to the store to get cigarettes and a, and a pop, and that they would be back in a little while. They didn't take anything with them, and they never went anywhere without their makeup, so that's what made me think they were coming right back. Diane and Jennifer headed for the Mini Mart a few blocks away. When they didn't return immediately, it was not cause for alarm, for the two young women were always up for an adventure. Hello, hello. Hi. You guys having fun? They were pretty open to just about anybody. They like to hang out, they like to have lots of friends, but they like to go, go, go. They wanted to be doing something all the time. They didn't care if it was three in the morning or three in the afternoon. On the day they disappeared, Diane and Jennifer were seen at the Mini Mart around 7 p.m. Hey, girls. Hey. How are we doing? Good. The cashier said the girls bought cigarettes and soda then sat outside the store. Two hours passed and the girls were still sitting there when the cashier saw a man pull up in a blue truck. They conversed for quite a while. They got into the truck and then the truck drove off and that's the last time that uh, anyone that we know of has seen them alive. Three months later, two men were hunting in a remote desert a hundred miles north of Phoenix when they came upon two bodies. Diane Lynn Shawcroft lay on top of Jennifer Sue Luth. Both girls had been murdered. Because the investigation is ongoing, police are withholding the cause of death. But the location of the girls' bodies offers several clues as to who the killer or killers might be. This area is extremely isolated, 16 miles from the nearest highway and accessible only by pickup truck or four-wheel drive. We feel that this person has probably been in this area or frequent in this area or certainly was aware of this area in some way by their own uh, four-wheel driving or hunting or at least uh, some personal knowledge of the area. And it's likely the killer was not alone. Jennifer was a strong girl, and she was a scrapper if she needed to be. It wouldn't be easy for one person to overpower Jennifer alone, but with two of them, it's, it's just sort of inconceivable to me that one person was able to do that to two girls. 
The investigation centered on finding the man in the blue truck. Believing that the girls knew this man, police focused on their personal lives. While in Phoenix, Diane and Jennifer had been to many parties and to many nightclubs. To us. <laughs> they had a lifestyle with a lot of males involved in it. They were a lot of male friends, male relationships. They were involved in so many people's lives. They were involved in many strangers' lives uh, to the point it could have been somebody they just met. Where are you from? We're from Colorado. I think both Ginny and Diana were very naive and very innocent. I think like most 19-year-olds, they think they're invincible and can just conquer the world. Well, that reminds me, my friend's having a uh, little pool party tonight. There's going to be kegs, lots of people. You guys should come down. Really? Yeah. And I think whoever got involved with them knew that, could read them like a book, and took advantage of them. There is one final strange twist to this case. The families erected a shrine where the bodies were found. Pictures of both girls were placed at the foot of two wooden crosses. Police decided to occasionally survey the site, hoping to find evidence of a visit from the killer. Four years later, they found it. Both photos of the girls had been removed from their frames. Only police and the victim's family knew the exact location where the girls' bodies had been found. Nothing else seemed to be disturbed, and it definitely raised questions as to who would want the pictures, who would go to that much effort uh, to go back in as far as it is to get the pictures and, and take them. Hard to even imagine who it would be or, or why they would do it unless it's the perpetrator. However, no evidence that might identify the murderer has ever been found. The search for Diane and Jennifer's killer or killers continues. Authorities would like to question the man in the blue pickup truck who was the last person seen with the girls. If you have any information on this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a homeowner is found dead in his basement. Will these secret diaries lead to his killer? Folsom, West Virginia. Police arrive at the house of a wealthy farmer named Tim Good. They have received a mysterious tip from a surprising source, a thief who has broken into the house and found more than he bargained for. The caller simply said, look in the basement. Behind a closed door, police made their own grisly discovery. The decomposed body of the homeowner. Thirty-seven-year-old Tim Good. He had been strangled and left undisturbed for over a year. Where the body was located, it was basically a dungeon or a cell. Uh, bare walls, concrete floor. Upstairs of the, the residence, it was lavishly furnished. A hot tub jacuzzi, three large screen TVs, a wet bar. It was very nice upstairs, and it was a dungeon in the basement. Pretty strange, huh? Yeah, sure is. What's the story on this here? The investigation quickly revealed that someone had been living in the house almost the entire time that Tim Good's dead body was rotting in the basement. All of the air vents had been sealed to prevent the smell from wafting upstairs. The scene was strangely medieval. In the basement, a man was dying like a prisoner in a dungeon, while upstairs, someone else was living like a king. The fact that the dying prisoner was the homeowner himself had police completely mystified. Tim Good had owned and operated a 350-acre dairy farm in Collinsville, Pennsylvania. One of his employees was a young man named Gene Kennedy, who had come from a broken home. Tim was Gene's unofficial guardian. 
when I first come to live with Tim, instead of making it feel like he was just giving it to me, it was like I was learning something, you know. 13 years old, 50 bucks a week, and being on your own and a place to live, that was pretty neat for me. Handyman Ben Freeman was the next to be hired. Found some coolant in the oil pan. I'm getting ready to take this filter off and see if it's contaminated. Within months, Freeman and his wife Eliza had moved into the main house and into Tim's life. Say, Tim, I was wondering. Yeah, man. I'm going to be leading a Bible study up at the house later this evening. Thought you might like to come up and check it out. By what time? Freeman was something of a self-styled preacher. Tim was estranged from his family, and he turned to Freeman for spiritual guidance. Ben would have an unusual twist to the way he spoke with Tim, uh, implying that he knew more than what most people did, and therefore Tim looked at him as being a very wise man. But Freeman had his own agenda. Gene Kennedy claims that Freeman began to act as if he owned the farm. What are you doing? I told you don't come here until you call. I live here too. Yeah, well, you can't come in right now. I'll be in and out, all right? Look, my wife's asleep upstairs. You can't come I'll in. I'll be quiet. Get, get you little. I told you. Hey, what are you guys doing? Knock it off. Just back off then, OK? My wife's asleep upstairs. Look, I understand that, but he lives here too. When Ben showed up, it wasn't, I'd say, about a year after that, Tim stopped dairy farm. You know, you come down on the farm, there's no cows. There was no calves. There was no dry stock. Everything was empty. Tim looked at me one day, and he said, you're going to hate me. He says, I sold the farm. He says, I got a million dollars for the farm, maybe a little more. <laughs> and he'd laugh. He thought that was really funny. He was real proud of himself. Tim then turned around and bought another much smaller farm in West Virginia. Freeman and his family made the move too. Oddly, Freeman was now calling himself Dave. How about when you're done with that, clearing some more of that land over by the fence? Over by that big tree? It seemed more like Dave was the boss. Instead of Tim being the one that owned it, it seemed more like it Dave was. During this period, Freeman kept extensive diaries that revealed how he and his family lived comfortably upstairs while Tim became a virtual you, prisoner in the basement. Please bless this food and please watch over me. The diaries were very detailed. He indicated in the diaries what chores Timothy Good was to perform that day. He even indicated what Timothy Good was to eat that day, if he was allowed to eat that day. Every aspect of Timothy Good's life was controlled by Dave Friedman. Study, man, like you told me to do. Is that what I told you to do? Is there anything else I told you to do, Tim? You told me to clean the basement. That's right, I told you to clean the basement. Get up here. When did I tell you to clean that basement? Yesterday. Yesterday? Every single Yesterday. day, Tim did something that would irritate or disgust uh, Dave Friedman. You see? It's just my shoes, Ben, that's just all. Just your shoes. Basically, Timothy Good couldn't do anything correct. And everything that he did was a mistake, or it wasn't God's way to do it. God requires that you pray. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben. When I first met Tim, he used to come to my house all the time. We were every day seeing each other and talked every day. We talked a lot about farming and stuff, and he was going to get his farm cleaned up and do a lot of work to it and everything. But uh, then at the end, Tim just started staying away from me. In fact, George Anderson did not see Tim or Dave Freeman for about a year and just assumed that they had left the area. Then one afternoon, a taxi came up the road headed for Tim's farm. My grandkids was out in the yard, and they seen them, and they started hollering at me and telling me Dave and Liza was back. And so and I told them that I was going up and talk to Dave and find out about Tim, because Tim had been going for about a year. Hey, George, how's it going, buddy? Where you been? Oh, I was just up the house. It looked like somebody broke in the back window. All right, have you seen Tim? I asked him where Tim was at, and he said he hadn't seen Tim for a long time, and he had no idea. I believe that Dave Freeman came back to the Good Farm to remove the diaries. 
and I believe that they were surprised by the neighbors. And there's no way that he could have removed anything from the home without the neighbors observing that. Later that day, George Anderson's son-in-law gave Freeman and his family a ride to Washington, D.C. He dropped them off at a service station, and they have not been seen since. Two weeks later, police discovered Tim's decomposed body along with the diaries kept by Freeman. Grocery receipts showed that Freeman and his family had lived in the house for about seven months after Tim died. Tim's bank account, which had previously held almost a million dollars, had been drained to less than two dollars. Dave Freeman indicated in his diaries that Timothy Good questioned him about the money and Dave Freeman was starting to realize that he didn't quite have the control on Timothy Good that he had once had. And I believe that that quite possibly led to his de demise. Update. After the broadcast, a viewer called our phone center and said that he knew Freeman as William David Cooper, an auto mechanic. Cooper was, in fact, Freeman's real name. He had recently worked on the caller's car and made quite an impression. I'll take you right to the guy. The guy ripped me off in the first place. He got me for like over a thousand more than what he told me he was gonna get, and then, then he got all upset because I got upset. When I realized that it was a valid tip, I was pretty excited. I've been chasing this subject for a year and a half, and once I finally knew that I, he was within grasp, it was almost too good to be true. Within hours, police staked out Cooper's apartment. This surveillance video shows Cooper as he left the building the next morning. When he came out of the house, that's when it got real interesting. We could tell that this was a suspect. He matched the description. Our intensity rose. We really got excited. Four children were inside the apartment, so they waited for Cooper to leave, and then they made their move. William Cooper was arrested without incident. He pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He has since been released. Next, a clever scam fools thousands of unsuspecting victims. Beware. New York City, New York. People here have a reputation for being streetwise and savvy. Yet each year, New Yorkers lose more money to scams and con men than to bank robbers. Jerry Diner was a typical unsuspecting victim. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I was at a telephone in Midtown outside, and uh, as I finished up my call, okay. a guy comes up right. to me, sounded kind of drunk. Excuse me, excuse me. Yeah? Uh, I just found this bank envelope on the street, and this was inside of it. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you'd do me a favor. Uh, could you call well, this guy up and tell him I found this, because I want to give it back to him. And okay. he's holding a bank deposit envelope, and it's got Dr. Stone and the address. And uh, in his other hand, he's got these coins. And he couldn't make the telephone call himself. Okay, calm down, man. I finally get the doctor on the phone. And I said, I don't know how to explain this to you. Uh, I got a guy here. Yeah. And, um, and I said, uh, uh, doctor, I don't know what to do here. And the doctor says, um, look, if you could give him $100, then uh, you know I'll add that $100 onto there's a $1,000 reward. OK, if My I can do anything, I will. Really well, I certainly would appreciate it. Thank you very much. As it turned out, the phone number Jerry dialed was not a doctor's office but a payphone, and the man he spoke with was a con artist. What allowed me to be scammed was that it was totally non-threatening. It was always up to me. I could walk away, or I could go that next step further. When he was really drunk at the telephone, I could have just said, look, I can't handle this, Dr. Stone, boom, I'm out of here. Look, how much do you want for those coins? I just want a place to stay, something to drink, something no, to eat. No, I understand that. I understand that. But exactly how much do you want for the coins? $100. $100. All right, look, here's what I'll do. I'll take you over to my bank machine, and I'll get you $100, and then I'll take the coins over to the doctor. Can you do that for me? Yeah, sure. Oh, Come you're on. a saint. Come on. I'd like to say, you know, that I'm, like, really a good person, 
and that there was no greed involved. But it was kind of like an illegal thing that was going on because I was going to take those coins. I'm giving them 160, but, you know, I'm going to make five times that. So, yes, there was... Uh, you know, that illicit kind of feeling of, you know, well, I'm doing something a little weird here, and, uh, you know, and I'm going to get away with it. Once the fake transaction has gone down, the front man simply disappears into the crowd. I don't know anything about coins, so I thought I was doing a favor for the doctor. But in the cab, I looked at the coins, and it said rare on the coins, but then it listed the amounts. And one was 1350, one was 600, and one was like 300. And I'm going, why would he offer a thousand dollar reward for coins that are only worth like 2,000? That seemed like a little weird to me, but I figured, well, they really mean something to this guy. Most of the people taken in by this scam are sent to the same apartment building on the Upper East Side, which they believe to be Dr. Stone's right. office. I'm looking for Dr. Stone. Well, I'm sorry, there's no Dr. Stone here. In the last few years, we've estimated that about three or 4,000 people have, have actually come here with this coin scam. A lot of the times when these victims come here, they believe that in some way, myself or whoever else is working here that's in the lobby is an accomplice to this. And, um, you know, I always try to explain to them, if I was running this scam, would I actually bring you back to me? I never thought that I was being scammed for one second, not even for a millisecond. I was just caught up in this. I really want to thank you for this. You know? okay. I really felt like I was doing a good deed and making money at the same time. This simple scam has suckered people in New York, Florida, Boston, and Baltimore. In most cases, the coins are packaged like collector's coins, but basically, they're worthless. If you're approached by one of these con artists, please contact your local law enforcement agency immediately. In the little town of Epps, Alabama, two men enter the post office and ask for stamps. Sure. Uh, one stamp or the whole book? This is a robbery. There it is. Go ahead. Take it. Go ahead. Get in the back. Get in the back. Move it. Move it. Move it. After the blackmail jumped over the counter, he immediately began to give orders. You the postmaster? Yes. Where's the safe at? He seemed to be real familiar with the operations of a postal service. The blackmail gave all the orders. He would he told the white male everything to do, and he did it. Get over there, get over there. Move it, move it. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Stay calm, nobody gets hurt. Check the purse, check the purse. I never took money to work with me. I had a dollar and 38 cents. Is this all there is? That's all. I don't have much money on me. That's all there is. Kill her. No. Go, be calm. Be calm. Kill her. And the white male says, man, let's don't do that. Says, says she did everything we told her to. He says, OK, we will take her with us. The thieves made off with about $700 in cash and stamps. The gunman forced Opal Johnson into her car and followed his partner out into the country. He put his gun across his lap with his finger still on the trigger, and it was poking me in the side. And he was extremely nervous. What are you doing? You're going to shoot me. Just don't do anything stupid, and it'll be all right. Finally. The tiny convoy pulled into a remote clearing near Goggins Lake, three miles from town. Whatever you do, don't make him mad. I can't control him when he's mad, OK? Don't open the truck. Open the truck. Get out the car. Get out the car. What are you doing? What are you going to do to me? No, I don't want to. No. What are you doing? Get the truck. Get the truck oh, now. No. He said, give me your rings. I like those rings. And as I was taking my rings off, I looked at him, and his eyes looked as if he hated the world. I was sure that they were going to kill me. Oh, man, let's go. We need to dump the car. And I just thought, well, they'll drive my car off into the lake. She sit our faces. Who cares? We got to go. There's people coming. Let's go.
they got in their car and they left. And when I could not hear it anymore, I began to feel around in the car and I could see if I could go into the car through the back seat and it's metal across there, no possible way. So then I found a tattoo and I took that tattoo and I began to work on that lock. And when I broke the lock enough, the trunk popped up and I come out of that trunk running. Within an hour, Opal had provided police with a detailed description of the two men. The first suspect would now be in his 40s. He was five feet five and weighed about 130 pounds. He had brown hair and green eyes and was probably not from the South. The second suspect was about six feet tall and slender. He would now be in his 50s. He had long, heavy sideburns, greasy hair, and dark eyes. Authorities believe he may have had family in the Epps area and that he may have worked for the Postal Service. Both men are wanted for kidnapping. There is a reward of up to $50,000 for information leading to a conviction. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, can this woman really talk to animals? In a moment, we put Sonia Fitzpatrick to the test. Houston, Texas. Racehorse trainer Mary Clark was worried. Her promising filly, Reckless, had been behaving strangely. Mary called an animal psychic, Sonia Fitzpatrick. Like the classic character, Dr. Doolittle, Sonia says that she can communicate with animals. Okay, Mary. I can tell you this horse is in terrible pain all down the left side of the face. And I don't know how she stood this pain. I don't know how she stood Pain was a plausible reason for the horse's unusual behavior over the past several months. What Sonia didn't know was that Reckless had been rearing back violently before all her races. Reckless and easy acting up in the starting gate. Even worse, she sometimes flipped over backwards, putting herself and her jockey in danger. And now she's telling me she's flipping to try and get away from the pain. When I heard the words flip, I was astonished because I hadn't discussed the flipping. And um, my heart was broken because that meant that this mare had been flipping in these races because of excruciating pain. No, it's not a tooth. It's, it's something I'm feeling. Good. I said to Mary, you really need to have this left side x-rayed because I feel there's something stuck in there. At Texas A&M University, veterinarians took x-rays of Reckless. The pictures confirmed that there was a mysterious foreign object embedded inside the horse's head. Next, a surgeon operated on the horse's jaw. You are not going to believe what we found. And he opened his hand and he said, this is what we found in the mare's jawline. It was a metal fragment that had broken off from the horse's halter. Gosh. It was a pretty horrifying thing to look at. He said, this would have been the most painful thing I can ever imagine. Reckless recovered completely after the surgery, and she is now retired from racing and free from pain. Sonia truly talks to these horses. They are giving her conversation. They are sharing with her their, their feelings, their wants, and their desires. It's an amazing gift. Animals love to talk, and they love it when you answer them. The first time they have someone that answers them, they are so pleased. And it's like, oh, she really can talk our language. Can Sonia Fitzpatrick truly speak telepathically with animals? Thousands of her paying customers say, yes, she can. The skeptics, however, say no way. So we decided to put Sonia to the test and let you judge for yourself. Hello, Sonia. Nice to meet you. We asked Sonia to visit pets and owners that she had never met before. 
Sonia had no prior knowledge of their background or their ailments. What's this one's name? That's Minnie. Minnie? How old is Minnie? She's approximately five years old. Okay. Now, Minnie says she lives with other animals as well, so you better tell me what the <laughs> other cat's name is. The other cat's name is Murphy. Murphy? There was a time when she felt sick. I don't, I don't recall her being sick. She's feeling sick. What is it you use in your house, on the floors? We don't use anything on the floors other than vacuuming on the carpet and... No, she discussed the fact that my cat seemed to have some illness related to the cleaning products that I used on my kitchen floor. And the fact of the matter is the cat is now an outdoor cat and has been for some time. Now, Minnie thinks she's in charge, and she's telling me she's in charge, so I... Overall, I would say on a scale of 1 to 10, she got 2 right out of 10. Some animals are really clear with their communication and very direct, and then just as people, others don't communicate so well, so before they can send you a reply back. So that is the reason why sometimes I don't always get something, and I do occasionally get animals like that. Hello, beautiful. Hi, what's your horse's name? Charlie. Charlie. Oh, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie is an 11-year-old racehorse. Sonia has not been told that he almost died recently after suffering continual abuse from a previous owner. He's very emotional. He's, um, he's had a lot of pain in his life, and I'm feeling that pain from him. And he's had a tremendous amount of abuse. I was surprised that she picked up on the fact that he had been abused so quickly. Um, I really expected her to ask me questions that anybody could figure out, OK, well, from that, I would assume that he had been abused. But she basically started just talking to me. His leg has also had a problem here. Here, sorry, here. It was real strange that she would, would be able to pinpoint uh, an injury from his hip because there's, there's no scars. I mean, he was in such pain and agony at one time and something with the foot that was really painful. He has uh, a crack in his, in his hoof and she knew which hoof was cracked. And that brings back the memories. Every time the ears are touched. The hardest part is when an animal has been abused and sometimes even now I think, Oh, God, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear what's been done. I don't want to know, but I have to know. To be able to help them, I have to know what's going on. He wants to know, is he going to be staying with you forever and ever? Oh, absolutely. I get tremendous inner satisfaction, the fact that I've been able to be a voice for the animals. It feeds my soul. That's the only way I can tell you. It feeds my soul and my spirit. And yes, I love it. I love talking to the animals. Charlie. Oh, Charlie. <laughs> Next, a man discovers that his new wife right is hiding a dangerous past. Augusta, Georgia. Two young servicemen stationed at nearby Fort Gordon were at the Richmond County Fair. One of them met a woman that would change his life. What attracted me to George, I think, was uh, the dark hair and real dark eyes. It, it was kind of like a mystery. You know, I wanted to know who she was, meet her, talk with her. She was just interesting. Georgia told Daryl that her father was a Cherokee Indian, that she was born on a reservation in North Carolina. She said that most people called her Jerry, not Georgia. Daryl Tacey fell head over heels in love with the woman that he continued to call Jerry. But over the next two and a half years, the more he got to know her, the more mysterious she became. The first surprise was that Georgia worked at a go-go bar in Augusta, three miles from Fort Gordon. Daryl was soon spending every free moment at the bar watching Georgia dance. She told Daryl that she was divorced and that her two young daughters, Sally and Angel, lived with a woman that Georgia called Granny. Daryl later learned 
that she was not a blood relative. Granny, this is Daryl. Hi, Daryl. Within two weeks, Georgia and her daughters moved into Daryl's house. It wasn't long before he noticed that Georgia was paranoid about something or someone. Georgia finally admitted that she was afraid her ex-husband would try to kidnap the children. Six weeks later, members of the outlaw motorcycle gang, the Devil's Disciples, showed up at the club. No, you go back to Atlanta and tell them to forget. She was scared, and I asked her, what's wrong? And she said, I used to run with the Disciples in Atlanta, and they're the here disciples. to they take, take me back. back. To Atlanta. Don't worry, I'm not gonna let anybody take you away from me. When Georgia and Daryl left the club that night, three Devil's Disciples were waiting. They're back there! Yeah, I know. Just hang on. We tried to lose a van. We were running red lights, stop signs. And, but the van was staying with us. They're right on us! All right, just hang on. When a police car began to chase them, Daryl fishtailed onto a side street and the van sped away. She would not say anything what she was really doing with them. She did not say if any of these were the father of the children or anything. And she just really did not want to talk about it. And if she didn't want to talk about it, she wouldn't say a word at all. Six months after Darrell met Georgia, the Army reassigned them to Fort Ord across the country in Northern California. On the trip west, he and Georgia were married. Can I help you with that? No, but you can get the door. By the time they arrived at Fort Ord, Georgia was pregnant. It seemed that their troubles were far behind them. However, just a few months later, someone began harassing Georgia, usually when Daryl worked late. Sally! 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 Ah! I'm gonna get you! One time, the stalker arrived when Daryl was at home. We called the MPs. They came over and checked around the house. I don't see anybody, babe. And they could find anything. She told me that she would tell me everything about her past at a later date. She just did not want me to know a lot of things that could hurt me. And she asked me if anything ever happened to her to please take care of her children. And I said I would. When Georgia gave birth to their first son, she suffered complications, and Daryl was granted a hardship discharge. They moved back to his hometown in Michigan, where Georgia became pregnant again. After their second son was born, she began to have violent headaches. Up, okay, you guys are getting up walking around. It's the only way your headaches are going to go away. Well, after a couple of weeks of this, I called an ambulance because she could not get up to even go to the bathroom anymore. The ambulance came and picked her up and took her to the hospital. Georgia lapsed into a coma. The diagnosis, a brain aneurysm. Technically, Georgia was brain dead. Why don't you spend some time with her and come see me in my office? Is there a chance? I don't think so, Daryl. Georgia Tacey was just 22 years old when she died. She left behind two daughters from her first marriage, two young sons from her marriage to Daryl, and a legacy of unanswered questions. I don't care about what she did in her past. I'm not looking to find out what she had done or anything else. I want to know who she is, and I want to know her side of the family so I can tell them this lady has died. Because as far as I know, 
Nobody knows. Update. Daryl Pacey's long search is finally over. On the night of our broadcast, a viewer called with the news that Georgia's real name was Edith Geraldine Johns Moore. A few days later, Daryl and all his children arrived in Savannah, Georgia for a reunion with his late wife's family. I was nervous about meeting these people. I didn't know how they would take this. Uh, I figured there'd be tears, and so I was really leery, scared, I guess you could call it. But after I met them, there were the tears, but I felt relieved finally to tell them she had passed away. The reunion was a mix of sadness and joy. Perhaps the happiest moment was when Sally and Angel met their natural father, Gary Moore, for the first time since they were very young children. That's your grandpa, grandpa. <laughs> it was, it still is unreal. I mean, it's hard to comprehend all this is happening. I found my two daughters after 15 years, plus I'm a grandfather twice over. That still takes a little getting used to. I'm too young to be a grandfather, but <laughs> I reckon I'll have to accept it. Sally and Angel received even a bigger surprise when they learned that their mother had two other children from a previous marriage, Eugene and Rhonda. By bringing together Sally and Angel with their blood relatives, Daryl felt that he had finally fulfilled his obligation to his late wife. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk with, with the family and we may get together and just get to know each other. I think that's the first thing we have to do. 14 years is a long time.